Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. I am Mike Snell, an Extension Specialist, Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture here at Oklahoma State University. I'm anxious and excited today to help present the uh, fifth webinar of the Shackleford webinar series. Uh, I'd like to again formally thank Linda Shackleford and Charles Shackleford, former co owners of TLC Oklahoma City, for financially underwriting this endeavor. Uh, like they've helped us here at OSU for well over 30 years now. So thanks again, Lyndon Charles. Uh, for those of you that are in attendance today, feel free to throw out questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Dr. Uh, Rowe will answer those towards the end of his presentation. I also would like to thank my co-hosts, Donna Dollins and Peter Harwell for their assistance today as well. So I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Brad Rowe from Michigan State University. University. And he's directed the Michigan State University Green Roof Research Program since its inception in the year 2000. He was the founding chair of the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities Research Committee, which was involved in the design and implementation of the 10 and a half acre green roof at Ford Motor Company's assembly plant in Dearborn, Michigan. And Brad's been the recipient of several awards. Time doesn't permit me to go into all those. But I would like to say that the MSU Green Roof Research Team is currently conducting research on plant selection, growing substrates, stormwater runoff, energy conservation, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, and roof vegetable production. He's given presentations on green roofs in numerous foreign countries. So he's lectured all over the world. And in the year, well, just last year in 2020, he was named in the top 2% of scientists in the world by the scientific journal PLOS Biology. Dr. Rowe also teaches a course on green roofs at MSU, has installed green roofs over his home garage, and the one that I really like well, he's even treated his dogs to a green roof, which you're gonna see, I believe, in his PowerPoint here in a few minutes. And if that weren't enough, and I'm not sure when he sleeps, but Dr. Rowe also owns and operates a small blueberry farm. So Brad, welcome to Oklahoma, and I'm gonna turn the program over to you, okay? Okay, so green roofs are not new. Okay, so if, if you are a pioneer going west, and say you're in Kansas or Oklahoma here, and you're gonna build your house, you're gonna use the materials that are available. So you would use sod, so you would have sod roofs. If you go back in time, I mean, even in the Norwegian countries, they still use green roofs. Of course, back in the Middle Ages and so forth, it was just sod. Uh, did they leak? I'm sure they did, but they were the best materials they had available. I mean, if you were, say if the year is 1600 or 1500 and you're in Scandinavia and you build a house, there's lots of sod around, you use sod for your roofing material. What do you use for a roofing membrane? Primarily something like birch bark. Best material you had. Go even back further, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. That was a green roof. All right, so now when you get into the modern area, we start having this you know, oil-based bitumen type materials, which do make much better roofing membranes. Then kind of green roofs, more or less went away, but they did start coming back primarily in Germany right around World War II and afterwards. Um, Germany is still the leader in green roofs. In fact, some, some of the cities in Germany have, um, you know, 95% of the buildings in the city have green roofs on them, and they use that as a stormwater uh, function. Okay, so they're not new, but the modern era is fairly new. But now what we're doing is just putting the green back over, say, that roofing membrane. So to define them, there's generally two different types, what you could call an intensive green roof and an extensive green roof. So what's the difference? Intense, think, say, intense maintenance. It's the purpose is primarily for people to be on it. For example, in that picture on the left, it's a park. You could eat lunch there. It's a plaza. So it's the whole thing might not be green. It's meant to have people there. 
it tends to be more expensive for a couple of reasons. One, if I'm gonna grow something like trees, the soil has to be deeper, which is also gonna mean it's gonna be heavier, which means that the building has to be strong enough to hold it. Because it could be deeper, it completely widens what plants you can use. I mean, you can find trees and shrubs and pretty much everything up there. And you're limited more or less to flat roofs unless you have terraces. On the right is what you would call an extensive green roof, tend to be very shallow. The, very, the definition varies. Some people say four inches a meteor or less, some say six inches or less. It's a continuum as far as I'm concerned. I mean, just because you get the four inches and now you add another quarter inch, you're not automatically, now you're an intensive green roof. It also depends where you're at. If you're in an area, say like Nova Scotia, four inches of media is actually pretty good to grow a whole bunch of herbaceous perennials and so forth. If you're in North Carolina, it's not the case. So it, it varies. But for the most part, they're much shallower, which limits what you can grow. And a lot of cases, it's succulents such as sedum because they're so drought tolerant. They're gonna be a lot less expensive. Generally, they're not gonna be irrigated. You just put it up there and it's more of a functional thing. Um, oftentimes, you never even see them. I mean, they're not really meant to be parks or someone to be up there and maintenance is much less. So that's a continuum between like on the right, a very extensive low maintenance green roof, primarily for function. On the left, it could be a landscape that you would see in ground level. So a few examples, just because you have a plant or a tree on your roof, does it make it a green roof as you see here? This is a green roof. This is in a hotel in Vancouver, British Columbia. So if you're checking into the hotel, this is what's above you. If any of you have ever been to Vancouver, it's a very compact city. There's really no place to really do much expansion. You know, you've got the ocean on one side, mountains on the other. So they've built up and they've put a lot of their green area on top of the buildings. So, so for example, if this actual seminar was in person and we were at this hotel in Vancouver, would be in the room right now. And when I was done speaking, you would go out in the hallway and you could go out the doors and you would go out in an area like this. Over to the right, there's some picnic tables and, and so forth. So this is an example of growing actual a forest for that matter on top of the roof. I put this one in here because it's a green roof, but also just the architecture just kind of blows me away. It's just completely different, but that's a spiral that's in Germany. So the people that live here, they can just go up on the roof and then uh, basically walk in a park. It's kind of a private park. There's a picture of it from say a drone. So you can see what it looks like. This is one of my favorite roofs. This is uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. This is their convention um, headquarters. So you can see you have all these terraces on the side where they're growing trees. And when you get up to the very top, it's a prairie. This is all native vegetation from around the area which they planted there. The difference between this and say your native vegetation say up in those mountains is this is well maintained I mean they go through and they weed it to get anything they don't want I mean they also water it some but it's I mean it's a fantastic roof and then just the view behind it and it's it's pretty large some unusual one this is uh in San Francisco the California Academy of Sciences What's unique about this one is you see the different slopes and then you have north, south, east and west facing slopes. You have all these different microclimates. So they planted all these different plants up there but then everything finds its niche. You know, if it's more drought tolerance on the west side of say a dome 
If it's not, it's on the east side. So it's like developed its own plant communities. Chicago City Hall is one of the first ones, say, in the US. I think it was put in around 2001 or two. You see a couple of trees in there in the center. Uh, primarily, it's a lot of herbaceous perennials. There's some sedum up there. Another thing you notice on that roof is that only part of the roof is green. This just points out the whole political aspect of green roofs. So this building, I forget what's what, but part of it's like city government, part of it's county government or whatever, and one decided they wanted a green roof and the other decided they didn't. Go to Norway, okay, very easy to grow grass on roofs there just because it never really gets hot and you have quite a bit of moisture or rainfall which is spread throughout the year. Is this roof is in uh, Northern Michigan. This is uh, one of my former students. She took my green roof class and then she graduated, eventually got married and this is the house they built. So in this case, the green roof portion is they just, the soil that they scraped off to build the house, if they had a seed bank in it, they just put that back on the top. And then, so what's growing there is the vegetation that's all around it. So if you fly over this, you'll see the driveway going up to the house, but you don't really see, it's like the driveway goes to nowhere. And there, there's a view from the actual top. So at least I can say, and you know, teaching for over 25 years, I've at least had an impact on one student. All right, when you get to the extensive groups, which are very shallow. So this one here, this is in, um, actually this one's in Japan. That's only about an inch deep. And that's all different types of sedum growing there because they can actually take that far as the environment. Okay, Ford Motor Company, this is the truck assembly plant in Dearborn, um, which Mike mentioned earlier, this is 10 and a half acres. This is how I got involved in this whole green roof thing to start with. So this again is pretty shallow. Um, and Guinness Book of World Records is actually listed as the largest green roof in the world. Um, that is somewhat debatable because it depends on your definition of what a green roof is. For example, if you looked at Millennium Park in Chicago. Okay, so is this a green roof or not? It's at ground level, so some people would say it's not, but it's over a underground parking garage. So as far as the same principles go, you're putting vegetation on top of a structure. So you're putting the soil there and planting it, whatever plants you're using and so forth. In this case, making a park out of it. So as far as, I mean, I would say it's, it is a green roof because it's using those principles. And instead of just having a big parking garage, the whole top is asphalt, you have very usable space in some green space. On the other extreme would be very small green roofs like this mailbox or some that are very high. This is in Switzerland up in the Alps. Another one that's pretty high, this is on the Empire State Building in New York City. That's about the 34th floor, so it goes up higher. And it's interesting too, when you consider when you go up that high, the elements like the wind and so forth are much stronger. So it becomes harder and harder to actually do a green roof. Some very unusual buildings. This is a T-Mobile um, office building in Stuttgart, Germany. So this one, which is in Singapore, just the architecture here is just kind of amazing. I mean, that's all turf. You can just walk right up onto it. And then another one, again, using green roof principles will be the High Line. This is in New York City. If you're familiar with this, what this is is an elevated um, old railway system. So, you know, back 100 years ago or whatever in New York, 
before there were really cars or the beginning of cars, everything was moved by rail. And then they elevated the rail because everyone was moving around on horses and buggies and so forth. And the trains would keep hitting horses and so forth. And so they just put it above it. Okay, so eventually they quit using that part because of the subway system and so forth. But a group of people called the Friends of the High Line, they developed this nonprofit organization and they made it into a park. So it goes about three or four miles where it's just essentially a green roof. And it's actually the most, the number one tourist attraction as far as visitation in the city of New York, which is saying quite a bit. And I have on there, the soil depth is 18 inches. In some places it is, in some places it's not, but it's primarily herbaceous perennials. And there's a few other pictures of it. Um, at different points. So it's very narrow, but it goes through that whole city. So, so this is good and bad. It's been very good as far as revitalizing, revitalizing that whole west side of Manhattan. Going along with that, real estate prices spiked a lot right along it and displaced some people. So again, with anything, there's pluses and minuses. This green roof, is, is this a sustainable practice? Not really. Um, this guy actually sells green roofs, so it kind of makes sense. He's in, he's in Germany. Although I don't think I'd want to actually take that car on the Autobahn, you know, up to 100 miles an hour, thinking that that could fly off of there and onto the car behind you. But as far as just driving around the city or making a point of what he's doing, it kind of makes sense. Um, the MSU, the, the green bus. Okay, so this is actually Photoshop. I put that on there, but there are a lot of buses that have green roofs on them. Again, does it really make sense to do that? Probably not, but it's kind of a novelty. Okay, with the MSU bus system, as this is on the MSU campus, we have... Um, nine green roofs on campus. The problem is most of them no one ever sees. So this is a very small one just at this bus shelter we put on so people can actually see it. So many more people have seen this than say the larger ones at the top of buildings. And then this one was mentioned, this would be my favorite green roof. Um, there with the two dogs. That's been, I built that about 2005, and I'll show you later actually how I actually built that. And then I had to put one picture in here of green walls. This is in Paris, right near the Eiffel Tower, which is essentially a green roof on its side. And this is actually much more difficult to do than just doing a green roof, but that's in another topic. Okay, so. Seen some examples, you know, why would anyone even do this? I mean, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy. Well, first of all, that roof is really ugly and that's what most roofs look like. It's, it's, it's a wasted space. When you have something like that, when it could look like that. Okay, so one reason would be just aesthetics. And then you can see where I'm going here with this, as far as green roofs and rooftops, as far as aesthetics go. Human health. Okay, so this goes not just for green roofs, but any green space, people see trees, plants, they're going to be healthier. I mean, there's tons of studies shown in hospitals. So this is this hospital in Basel, Switzerland. This is the roof, well, of the hospital. There's actually, I think, eight or nine different buildings there. So this is the main one. And that roof has been on there since World War II. The original reason wasn't actually for looks or human health. It was actually put on there for camouflage during World War II. And they weren't really concerned about having trees or anything. They were just trying to hide the building but over time it's morphed into this park. 
You've got, uh, this is a YouTube, it used to be the Gap headquarters. Now this building is owned by YouTube in uh, South San Francisco. So they built this to blend in with the surrounding area. It's very close to the airport. And one added benefit was it actually reduces sound. It deadens sound that goes through that building because it has to go through this outer layer through the soil. Okay, growing vegetables or food on roofs. So this is Grand Rapids Community College in Michigan. So that little plot there right in the front, they're growing a bunch of different herbs. So in this case, it's more of uh, the people in maintenance are doing it and they're probably harvesting and potentially using it or it's being used primarily as a demonstration. This one, okay, I talked to this chef, is going back to Vancouver. So they're growing all kinds of herbs and so forth up on top of the roof of the hotel. And then they harvest these and they go down into the restaurant. And this chef claimed that they'd save $40,000 a year just by growing their own uh, herbs and so forth up on the roof. The other part of this is that people know it's there, it's been advertised, people talk about it, and people go to that restaurant knowing that, okay, so theoretically, some of these vegetables and so forth that you're gonna be eating could have been picked 15 minutes before you're eating it. Also, half one side of this hotel looks out to the ocean, the other side looks out to this garden, so to speak. And they can actually, they normally would charge higher prices looking out at the ocean, and I think that's still the case, but they still have people requesting rooms that look out over this. Another restaurant on Common Ground Restaurant in Chicago. So they're growing a bunch of vegetables and raised beds on their roof. And when I ate there one time, they told me that everything that I was eating was grown on their roof, which I know can't be true because I know my wild uh, Pacific salmon didn't come from the roof, but everything in the salad likely did. This would be seasonal, so this would only work during the summer unless you, say, put a greenhouse up there. But I still like the idea of it. It's very local food production, and it's saving them money as long as they have someone that knows how to do this and how to actually garden and grow the plants. Speaking of greenhouses, um, a company called Gotham Greens, okay, so they have locations. They started in New York. That's the name, but they have locations in New York and Baltimore, and I think Boston, I know Chicago, and now even Denver, and I think they're starting one in California. They've just got greenhouses, in some cases on a roof, like in Chicago. So they're utilizing that space. So underneath this, this is a company that makes um, cleaning supplies. And they have an agreement with them to use that space. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. So they're both benefiting. The, the space is being used. They're producing a whole bunch of lettuce greens. And then that's their business. And they apparently are doing very well because they keep expanding. A little more traditional, if you speak, uh, just growing plants or growing vegetables and so forth on a roof, the Brooklyn Grange, uh, the Navy Yard Farm. So this is in Brooklyn, right on the water, right on the East River. So you look across and you see Manhattan. This particular farm is about three or four, maybe five acres. Everything they grow is sold locally. It's a so community supported agriculture, so they have members. Uh, probably nothing goes more than a few miles away from where they're actually growing it. So that's, well, that one there would be the Brooklyn Grange Navy Yard Farm, which is in Brooklyn. This one too is also in Brooklyn. This is an E Street. Um, and you can look over and see across the river. 
In Washington, D.C., there's Uptop Farms. This is a guy, geez, he might be 30 years old now. He started this and he has about four or five, maybe even six farms now growing on different buildings. And he's essentially, he gets free area to grow, which doesn't really exist at ground level unless you grow it outside of town and bring it in. So you can grow it right where you're using it. He's got the land and then he, but he has to take care of the roof. So they have different arrangements, but they're using normally wasted space to grow food. There's another one of their farms. So, so what are they growing? All different types of vegetables. They're, in this case, you got some greens and so forth, and then they deliver these around town on bicycles. Okay, far as can you grow? So, so first of all, when you think when you're growing on a roof, the deeper you make it, the heavier it's gonna be. So that could be a problem. So what can you grow? Can you use green roof media? Does it have to be really deep? I mean, we've done lots of experiments on this. Some in the greenhouse, you see there at the top left on some roof platforms at the bottom right. In that case, that's peppers and um, some cucumbers growing. So quite a few experiments on that. This is on the plant and soil science building where we were growing chives, which was very easy, some tomatoes, some green beans and so forth. And actually what we found um, is it actually worked really well, even in only five inches of soil. And actually in some of these experiments, I compared to this with what we did at ground level, and they actually did better on the roof. And you say, well, why is that? Several reasons. One, you can make the soil exactly the way you want it. If you're growing, say in your garden, you can kind of modify the soil by adding a lot of compost and so forth. But if you had very clay soil, it just doesn't do very well. The other advantage you have doing it on a roof is vandalism. And well, I'm thinking vandalism of people, but also varmints. Okay, you're not going to have deer up there. You're not going to have rabbits up there. A lot of the pests that are going to be a problem for what you're growing just aren't there. They can't get up there. You are going to have birds, but they're generally not that big a problem. So as long as you irrigate it, our actual yields were higher than they were in our gardens plots that were at ground level. One thing you've got to consider, though, when you're doing anything on a roof would be pollinators. Even going up. This is essentially two stories high right here. We had problems with some pollination because the bees just don't go up there. So every farm that I've actually been on, it's on a rooftop, I mean, of any size, they have their own beehives up there to maintain, make sure they have enough pollination. Still on the MSU campus, this is up on one of the dorms. So this small section, this is uh, the students that live right here on this floor, they're in a RISE program. It's the Residential Initiative on Sustainable Environment. So they have a greenhouse at ground level and then they grow all these plants on this green roof. Then they actually sell some of these to the cafeteria. So if you get a salad or so forth in the cafeteria, you might be eating plants that students actually grow. And there's some other pictures. So they've grown a lot of different things, including strawberries. And it's a very small area, but you can get a lot of produce out of a small plot. Okay, mention a lot of vegetables, herbs, that makes the most sense. You can also grow, like in this picture in Italy, it's like pomegranates. I have seen some apples and peach trees and so forth growing on roofs, but it really doesn't make that much sense unless maybe it's an apartment building, you have a little space and you have one tree. To do this commercially doesn't really make much sense though. And it's not gonna be anything like large agriculture, you're not gonna grow a big field of corn up there and bring a combine up there. It's gonna be all high value horticultural crops, primarily a lot of greens, 
which is what makes the most sense. I throw this in here because I put this watermelon up on a roof. Um, just set it in there and some sedum, and then I put this on our website and called it sedum cucurbita. And you wouldn't believe how many people sent me emails wanting this plant that produced these watermelons. Okay, so besides urban agriculture, advertising. Okay, so this crab is Italian grill. On the awning here, they put a bunch of shrubs and plants on there. It sets them apart from other people or other restaurants. You might not remember the name, but you'd remember, yeah, it's that place that has the plants growing on it. So far as public relations and advertising, it works. The main reason green roofs are put on is stormwater. So what's the problem with stormwater? If you go out into the woods and it rains, you know, throughout the whole year, probably 95% of the rain that falls either evaporates from the leaves or infiltrates into the ground and then gets into the groundwater. It doesn't just run off. When we build buildings, roads, sidewalks, parking lots, and so forth, when water hits that, it's hitting an impervious surface and you get this almost instantaneous runoff. You have to deal with that somehow. So we built municipal stormwater systems. Most of the municipal stormwater systems in the United States are so outdated that they just don't work really anymore. They're designed for a city or an area that was much smaller, but we keep building. So it's a constant battle to deal with this. If you look at your typical say city here, whether you have a combined sewer system or a separate system. So if you have a combined system, that means that rainwater and sewage are going into the same pipe. They're being routed to your wastewater treatment plant. Water's treated clean and then it's released back into the river, say in this case. The problem with that, as I mentioned, that the pipes, the system is so old and antiquated, it can't handle it. So you get certain rain events, the pipes are filled, the stormwater plant can't handle it, and you get what's called a combined sewage overflow. So then raw sewage goes directly into the river. The city of New York, it takes one fourth of an inch rainfall for a combined sewage overflow to actually occur. It's not gonna happen in every location, but there's almost every time it rains, there's like raw sewage going into the East River or into the Hudson River. Okay, so if you separate the systems, then your stormwater, not that it can't have pollutants in it, but it's gonna go directly into the river like it would do naturally. It might pick up oil and so forth along the way, but it's not sewage. And then your sewage is the only thing that goes to your wastewater treatment plant. Okay, and there, because you have a lot less in water coming into it, it's, it's much easier to handle it. And it's pretty steady as opposed to having a constant sewage flow. And then all of a sudden you get a torrential downpour and now you got to deal with that too. So you, you, greatly reduce the amount of combined sewage overflows or any sewage that go directly into the river. The city of Lansing is currently separating the systems, but this, this is costing millions and millions and millions of dollars and it's taking forever to do this. Okay, so I mentioned the city of New York. So if you just look at that's different areas. The green parts obviously would be where there's plants. You can see Central Park there in the middle of Manhattan. But for the most part, there's not a whole lot of green space there. And then when I mentioned the combined sewage overflows, this was the estimated annual sewage overflow through each outlet. So you can see the worst parts are up here in the Bronx and then down here in Brooklyn. The 
obviously they would be the less affluent areas. So that's where you're gonna have the, the biggest problem. Okay, so what can a green roof do here for this? So if you look at that blue line is your rainfall. And so it rains quite a bit, then it drops off. Okay, so then you have your typical runoff. So it hits the roof. It's your typical shingle roof, or maybe it's a gravel ballasted roof, but the water pretty much runs off pretty instantaneously. Whereas if there's a green roof there, you've got all this extra media up there and the plants that are transpiring and dry it out. So then it can actually hold water. So you've lowered this peak overflow. So why is that important? Well, you have less water running off and you've also spread it out over time. You have this lag time. So it might continue to drain through there even after it quits raining as opposed to constantly or instantaneously running off. So if my sewer system can handle X amount of water, and now because of the green roof, I've reduced that breaking point to below that, then I'm not gonna have that combined sewage overflow. So putting a green roof on one building is not gonna make a major um, impact, but when you do it on a lot of different roofs, it will. So one example of this would be the town of Vauban, Germany. If you go through this town, there's green roofs on practically everything. 95% of the buildings have green roofs on them. They never invested a dime in a municipal stormwater system. They don't need it. They do have see there's behind here there's a little surface ditch which any of your surface water it doesn't go into any pipes or anything it just runs off on the surface and then it goes there you see it right there it drains in and it goes into this retention pond so they've saved a lot of money by doing that what are they using that money for that's incentives to actually do the green roofs so which method is, makes the most sense? Which one is the cheapest? I guess it depends on the situation. In their case, they obviously felt that putting on green roofs made more sense, plus you get the other benefits, green roofs. That's the main reason that Ford put on that 10 and a half acre green roof. This area where the the Rouge um, complex is, it's over 100 years old now. This is where Henry Ford started building Model Ts. He had a steel mill at one end and Model Ts came out the other end. It is built in an area where you probably wouldn't build today because it was a low area, kind of a wetland. If you get a flood in that plant, you have to shut down operations. It's costing them several million dollars an hour to do that, to shut down operations. So I mentioned also this area here, I mean, it's been, they've been back before there was even an EPA, they dumped a lot of toxic chemicals and polyarometric hydrocarbon and so forth there. So about 20 years ago, William Ford, they were gonna make the decision whether to clean up this area or just abandon it and start over somewhere else. And they, Ford actually decided to fix it. So part of it was building this new plant, putting the green roofs on it. They put in all kinds of porous pavement and different swales and retention ponds and so forth, and did some phytoremediation to try to clean up some of the polyarometric hydrocarbons that were in some of the soils. So they spent millions and millions of dollars just trying to fix this site. And when this roof went in, I was involved with it to start with. I remember reading articles in Business Week and Newsweek and Time Magazine, all lambasting William Ford, telling him he was the dumbest CEO in America for spending money on a green roof. 
And then maybe 10 years later, Newsweek called it one of the greenest companies or top 20 greenest companies in the United States. So it was a completely new idea then, at least in the US. Um, now it's become much more accepted and more popular. Energy consumption, this is a test we did. This is on the plant and soil science building where my office is. So we actually cut through the insulation and so forth, didn't go through the membrane, but we put uh, thermocouples inside the building, uh, down at the membrane, just underneath the green roof portion and a meter above, and then just measured it and saw what heat fluxes went in, in and out of the building. And this is not our graph, but this demonstrates really what happens. So on the left there, you have your typical roof, it's a gravel ballast. So during a hot summer day, you have a lot of heat being radiated into the building through the roof, and then you'll lose some at night. Okay, on the right, that has a green roof on it. So you can see how that curve has just been more or less flattened. Okay, so on the left, all that area underneath that curve with a heat gain, that's cost for air conditioning because electricity is gonna be required to get rid of that heat or your building is gonna be warmer if you don't have that. The other thing you don't see here is the longevity of a roof membrane. I mean, what causes a roof to fail? Well, it leaks. That's what the sign that tells you there's a problem. But what causes that? A lot of it is that continuous heating and cooling, that expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction of that membrane. It fatigues, it, it cracks, it leaks. It needs to be torn off, repaired or torn off, and then replaced. So on campus, they roofs, they tell me they'll last about 30 years, 20 to 30 years, they usually patch them and make it last a little bit longer. With a green roof, the roof membrane will last two to three times as long. It's actually a roof in Switzerland and Zurich. It was built in 1914. It still has the original membrane over a hundred years later. You get a lot of protection by putting that green roof on. Urban heat island, whether it's a green roof or anything, um, plants, green space is going to reduce temperatures. On the left there, you see Toronto. On the right, Atlanta, the downtown area and the airport where you have a lot of impervious surface. What's the problem with urban heat island? Temperatures are much higher, which means more air conditioning costs. It also means more ozone poor air quality, which again translates into health benefits like air pollution, um, all your respiratory illnesses and so forth, increased costs, lost productivity. People have measured that. Solar panels. Often get the question, well, should I have a green roof or should I put on solar panels? I would say they work very well together. Solar panels, are the most efficient, the photovoltaic cells are most efficient around say about 75 degrees. Going back to the plant and soil science building, the area of that roof that did not have a green roof on it on a hot summer day, you know, say it's 85 degrees, it would be 120 degrees right above that roof. Okay, so if you put solar panels directly on that roof, then the efficiency of those solar panels is gonna go way down. Whereas if you have a green roof on there, it's more or less ambient temperature. So they actually work very well together. And then biodiversity, if there's plants, it's going to attract insects, birds, and so forth. You're providing habitat. You're also providing habitat for, you know, or biodiversity as far as plants, depending on what you put on it. Here's a good example of that. If you go back to Zurich, Switzerland, this is the water treatment plant I mentioned earlier. When this was originally built in 1914, they used the system where they took the soil and just put it back up there with the seed bank that was present. And it's over a foot deep. 
but there are actually some orchids growing on that roof now that don't exist anywhere else in the world. Since this was built, everything around, else around it got built up and essentially they were destroyed. So as far as benefits or why you would do it, everyone has their own reason, aesthetics, recovering green space, all the way down through to urban food production. The main reasons would be stormwater management. The second most reason, reason would be building insulation or energy conservation. Although you could make the argument, if that's the only reason you were putting on a green roof, it would be much cheaper just to put on more insulation. But the green roofs provide all these other benefits. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple of cases where they just took the soil and threw it up on the roof, but those were over a foot deep. If you're going to have a pretty shallow roof, you know, even four inches or less, or even, even six inches, it has to be very porous, so it'll drain. You're also putting weight up there, so you want this to be lightweight. Most soil, you know, you just put up there, that's pretty heavy. Then you have, you know, good aeration, but good water retention. I mean, that's the kind of a contradictory term, but it depends what you're growing, and exactly what you're looking for. And also you want something that's fairly permanent. For example, growing trees or plants in pots, they're using a lot of organic matter. And oftentimes that's like uh, pine bark and so forth. That's going to decompose and disappear. So if you put that up on the roof, one, it might blow away, but two, it's going to shrink over time. So you need something that's much more permanent. Okay, so what's often used something like heat expanded slate, which is what you see there, or heat expanded shale or different clays. It's heat expanded so it'll hold water, but it's also much lighter. You can make it deeper. It almost looks like cinders. It does take a lot of energy to expand that. So one thing I tried was uh, waste porcelain. This came out of a building that was remodeled. So that's old toilets, old dishes, and so forth. So we took this and we ground it up into different smaller pieces and to see if that would use as a base um, component for a green roof. So on that plot right there, there's actually three different types of media there. One's your typical normal green roof media. One is um, grow stone, which is heat expanding glass, which is used a lot in hydroponic systems. And the other is porcelain. So what we did was take that base material, the non-organic, and combine it with 20% organic matter and planted it just to see what would happen. For the most part, if you're talking an extensive green roof, you really can't tell the difference. So it does work in that case. Would it work for maybe if I'm trying to grow vegetables and I'm really concerned about yields, it probably isn't what you would want to use, but it does show some promise because it's a waste material. It's just gonna be thrown away. And then your embodied energy is a lot less in that than say using some of that heat expanded slate material. What plant species do you use? Okay, so here you see some moss growing in an old barn. So if you wait long enough, they'll just show up, but that's not really what we're talking about. Considerations to think about what you're gonna actually put up there. All right, what are the environmental conditions? So that can be several different things. You can be talking about the environment. For example, that picture there is the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. So that's a very dry environment, especially during the summer, as opposed to what your environmental conditions would be, say, in Nova Scotia or in Michigan, are completely different. That would go whether you were doing this at ground level or on a roof. You also have to consider the environmental conditions on the roof. As I mentioned, they're going to tend to be hotter, windier, and drier. Okay, what's your design intent? Is it intensive? 
Is it extensive? Is it there primarily just to cover the roof, and provide some stormwater benefits or energy benefits? Or is it a plaza? Is it a park for people to visit? The aesthetic appeal. This is a tough one because what one person thinks is aesthetically pleasing, someone else doesn't. For example, the green roof on the molecular plant sciences building, which is outside my window that I put in, which is all native uh, perennials, flowering perennials and grasses. Um, some people in that building thinks it's really ugly and they'd like to get rid of it. They want it to be mowed. I tend to disagree, but then you get all right, who's looking at it? Who's going to complain? Who isn't? Um, your media composition and media depth. Depth is probably the largest factor. You can change the composition somewhat to hold more moisture as long as you have enough drainage. Again, it depends what you're growing. Um, the installation method, I'll get into that a little bit later. But for example, installation methods like putting up Prevegetated mats like sod, um, can, or just filling the roof and then planting it, you're obviously not going to rule out sod that has like trees in it. How much maintenance do you want to do? And then the cost, of course, is always going to be a major factor. Okay, so. Here's some herbaceous perennials. Okay, that actually happens to be at my landscape, but that could be on a roof if you chose to do that. One of the first tests we did was using a bunch of native plants, herbaceous perennials. So this is in four inches of media. It was irrigated the first year to get things going, but after that it wasn't because in most cases roofs aren't going to be irrigated. So we wanted to see one planting sedum from plugs or planting sedum from seed or cuttings or herbaceous perennials. So what you see here, this is after three years, the herbaceous perennials that are there in the center. Okay, at this point, they look like they're all dead, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are, they could be dormant. But over this period of time, you can see on the left and right, the sedum did fantastic. The herbaceous perennials, for the most part, just started to disappear. There's no, at least in four inches without irrigation that they can't do it. You're going to have to be deeper or it's going to have to be watered. The CM, why does it do so well? Because it has metabolism, crassulation, acid metabolism. To put that in simple terms, if you're not familiar with it, Say a C3 plant, like say a maple tree, it's taking up a lot of water through the root system and it's transpiring a lot through the leaves because the stomates are open, so it's losing water. The stomates are open during the day, bringing in carbon dioxide in order to make sugars for the plant. So those plants need a lot of water. Something like sedum, the crassulation acid metabolism means that if water is limiting, what they'll do is that they're, uh, there's facultative and obligatory, but just to make it simple, if water is limiting, it'll close the stomates during the day. So it's not losing water. It'll open them at night, bring in CO2, store it, and then use that for photosynthesis. Those plants aren't gonna grow very fast or be very aggressive, but they can withstand a lot of drought. So if you put your typical C3 plant, like a lot of those herbaceous perennials on top of a roof and don't water them, they're gonna die. You put seed them up there, it's a dry environment, they'll thrive and they'll do very well, which is why sedum is often used on green roofs, at least shallow ones. Okay, so the molecular plant, plant science building. So this is, um, July of the year, this is the year after I planted it. So there you can see, in this case, there's a lot of Triscanthia, which is blooming. Um, you get into September, you got some Leatris, some Asters, Asters further down the year and getting into the fall. So 
So I don't really understand why some people think this is ugly, but some do. But you do have to consider it's not flowering all the time. Just like anything, it flowers and then it goes through the dormant or it dies and, and so forth. So then you get into 2013 in June, you can see what it looks like. You have a lot of, um, there is some allium cernuum in there. It's not all that visible, but you ought to have a lot of Coreopsis, which is those yellow flowers. And then you jump ahead to August, 2020. So over time, most of those herbaceous perennials, they didn't survive or they just kind of disappeared. And this is in eight inches of media. So even with eight inches, it's not really enough unless you're going to water it when it actually needs it or you make it even deeper. In this case, it's still 100% covered, but it's been taken over primarily by only a few species. There's a lot of allium in the middle there, which does very well in drought conditions. The other thing with growing, say, a native prairie on a roof, Okay, so Ducks Unlimited in Winnipeg, that's exactly what they're doing on their roof. The one thing that perpetuates a prairie would be burning. And believe it or not, they actually do a controlled burn on top of the roof. I'm not sure what the insurance company actually thinks about that, but they do it. As far as maintenance, on the left, the sedum roof, does require some maintenance, but not very much. If you had weeds or something that started growing in there that you didn't want, they're gonna die. It's too dry. They might germinate in the spring, but by July, they're all gonna be dead. And you're left with sedum or allium. On the right, okay, so maintenance as far as potentially watering it. If you have any herbaceous plant, a lot of weeds, herbaceous plants, um, perennials, annuals, vulgia might get a hold there, you might have to weed it. It really comes down to what you want it to look like um, as far as aesthetically. Here's a case of a school in Switzerland. That is a very functional green roof as far as stormwater and energy. For aesthetics, I suppose it looks better than just black tar. Um, it's primarily all weeds, at least what most people would consider weeds. So again, is it a good green roof? Yes. Is it not a good green roof? Depends on your viewpoint. So the influence on what species you're going to look at, um, aesthetics, native plants, plant diversity, uh, stormwater, energy, whether you irrigate or not. The irrigation is, a lot of people were very much against irrigation. Some cities have actually banned irrigating roofs. I think the problem with irrigation is that people don't irrigate correctly. If you only used it when it's really needed during a major drought to keep your investment alive, it makes sense. The problem is, People put them on timers and they irrigate it no matter whether it needs it or not. I don't know how many places I've gone by where irrigation was running in someone's lawn when it was pouring down in rain. Just a waste of water. The transpiration rates, uh, as far as stormwater, ideally, okay, you would want plants to transpire a lot and then dry everything out. The problem with that is those are your herbaceous plants that need a lot of water. And if the water is not present, they're gonna die unless you irrigate it. When the next rain comes, you want it to be as dry as possible so it holds as much water. So if you're irrigating, then you're not gonna get the maximum amount of water. So again, it's a trade-off. Soil fertility, sedum thrives on poor soils. You don't really need much in the way of fertility. If I'm growing vegetables, I'm trying to maximize yield. I want high nitrogen and so forth to produce fruit and vegetables. One problem with fertilizing a roof is, again, these are primarily porous media. They're pretty shallow. Any nitrogen you put on there is gonna leach through very quickly and it's gonna end up 
and say the river, how much maintenance you want to do, and all these things come back to depth. You can determine. A good example of that, if you look at that roof from a distance, you see some of those areas which are quite a bit greener. So if you zoom in on it, you can see because it's mounded and it's deeper. So those plants survive there, no problem. The very shallow areas, that's actually a lot of sedum growing in there, which is actually under a, quite a bit of stress, probably mostly nutrients, but also potentially water, because you can see it's got a lot of color to it. Their installation methods, three main ones, conventional build-up systems, modules, and prevegetated mats. Conventional build-up system, that's where you put down your membranes, you fill it with soil and you plant it. Spontaneous colonization is put the media up there, whatever seed comes in, that's what you get. You can plant the plants by plugs, you buy seed or cuttings. Like seed them, you just throw the leaves around as long as you get you know, a couple of rains and it doesn't dry out real fast, they'll root and they'll grow. Modules is like trays, prevegetative mats is like sod. So your typical components, you're gonna have a structural deck, you're gonna have a waterproofing membrane. That's gonna be on any roof, no matter what. Okay, your root barrier, that's put down to keep any roots from growing into the building. If you're growing something like sedum, that's never gonna be a problem. If you're putting bamboo up there, it could be a huge problem. You should never put something like bamboo on a roof. And say, well, I'm putting on a roof. I'm not planting any of those things like trees or bamboo. Maybe you're not, but you're putting the roof on and maybe 30 years from now, someone else does. So you need a root barrier. A drainage layer and filter fabric, that's to, you're gonna have to have an area under there where the water can run off instead of seeping through the soil. The filter fabric is keeping the media that's above from infiltrating down and clogging what's below it. And then your vegetation, it's your choice what you're growing, depending on the depth. How do you get the media up there? On the left, they're mixing it on a tarp, they're passing five gallon buckets, and then they're dumping that on the roof. Okay, that works if you have, you know, 100 people to help. Not a very efficient way to do it. One roof on the Com Arts building that I did, we took five gallon buckets up and down the elevator and just dumped them. It took all day long to do that just to get a few little research plots, um, not highly recommended. Other methods would be, for example, just get a crane and lift these giant bags up there and then just spread it out. Or you could even just blow it like they're on the right. Okay, and the roof, um, it, again, this is my house. I just rented this um, telehandler to just lift everything right up there. Well worth the cost of doing that rather than taking it up and down a ladder. So that's one method. So here's an example of spontaneous generation. That soil was just put up on the roof and the seeds germinated, whatever happened to be in the soil. So it matches everything that's around that. That's actually on a hen house in Switzerland. And the owner here told me that he increased his egg production by 7% when he put that green roof on there. Can't say I know anything about chickens, but apparently they're very sensitive to temperatures. I mentioned this one before. Again, spontaneous generation, what was in the seed bank in the soil is what grew. Okay, Millennium Park, okay, this is a typical landscape. So it's put in just like anything else. They mentioned it is at ground level, but you know, it is ordered plants in containers, planted it based on the design. You know, so not really a whole lot different than what you'd have on at yeah, ground level. Now, of course, in this case, it's very easy to deliver those plants because it is at ground level. Say if this was on the 13th floor, then you've got to get all these containers and these trees up there, which can create quite a problem. A Library of Congress where they store uh, essentially movies in Virginia. 
Okay, so the ground is sloped up to it. So this again, put the media up there and then you planted individual plants. How far apart you put them depends a lot on the budget. This is gonna to have to be watered to get it going. Uh, probably a lot of maintenance if there's weeds or something that come in there until it fills in. So here they're just dragging a hose around. And then you can see it's starting to reseed, but you still got a lot of bare areas there. Okay, so my doghouse. So how did I do that one? First, build the doghouse. And I sat down and thought about everything I needed so I don't have to make one trip to Home Depot, but I made about 15 trips. So eventually the structure was built. My waterproofing membrane, I just used six mil plastic sheeting. Okay, for a doghouse, I would not use this on your house or anything that you didn't want to leak. Although I can say that that's been around for 16 years now and there are no leaks on it. And there's never been any complaints from the inhabitants about leaking. But I just used that six mil plastic. So you can see what it looks like there. I cut that off on the edge. So I stapled this to the side in order to keep water from getting down the side. I used a roofing tar, which seemed to work pretty well. There's my drainage, I just left the gap. As far as seeding it, I had a whole bunch of seeds of different things. I just mixed together and put in sand to spread it out evenly. I threw some cuttings on, collected some cuttings and just threw them on there. I put these bamboo stakes on there to put a shade cloth over it and keep it above it. So what you see there, I did this in August, which isn't the ideal time. So I would just water it every morning and then at night when I got home from work. And then say a month later, it looked like that. And then in the future, some of the other plants like Talonum, which has an awesome plant, it's really bright. This, the problem with this one is it's not cold hardy enough for Michigan, but it does reseed itself pretty profusely. So it did last like three or four years, but once the entire thing was completely filled in, there wasn't really any open space for it to grow. In Maryland, it works great because it's not killed in the winter. And then there you see it in like four years later, and then in August, 2013. Okay, modules would be your trays. So this is one system. This is a live roof system where they have, you see that white part there, that's, it's a sleeve you pull out. So they grow them in the nursery. There's another type, this, in my opinion, this is too large because it's just too heavy. Those three guys don't really look like they're having a good time moving those. And you also get this checkerboard look here, which, okay, this is better than no green roof, but if I'm buying, a module system, I want it to be green. It's like they put these plugs in like the day before they shipped it. If I'm paying the extra premium, I would expect it to be green from day one, which is what you see in this. And then that's put up on the roof. In this case, the sleeve is that bluish color. They pull those out so you don't have that checkerboard look. This is um, the system being put up on a building on campus. They just lift those trays up there with a crane. You're taking them and putting them in place. And you can see all those sleeves that they're pulling out. It looks like all that paper. And that's what that roof looks like, you know, more or less right now. Then you've got pre-vegetated mats. That's what Ford did. So why did Ford choose pre-vegetated mats? A lot of it had to do with this went on in the fall of 2002. They were having a, uh, their 100 year heritage celebration in 2000, the following spring. So that roof was gonna be green no matter what. If they would have waited to plant in the spring, it wouldn't have been that way. So they 
they chose to do this particular system for that reason and you know several others. What they did they grew this out in the field. They grow 14 acres of it. This is over an old clay mine. Just put out the shade cloth or put out some uh, material on the bottom, just grew it. You can see the different rows there. Harvested it, cut it in pieces, stacked it, moved it a couple miles to the plant, and then laid it out. And that's what it looks like. And what it looks like at a different time of year when you get, you know, some fall colors and flowering and so forth. Now then you consider is slope. Doing things on slope makes things more difficult. This is what you don't want to happen. So what do you do? You could use terraces like you see there at the bottom, have some type of structural grid, your grid, you know, like that, what you see there in the middle picture, where it's kind of an accordion, you pull it apart and then you just fill it. That's what you see happening here. So for the most part, that'll keep that media in place. So that's what I used on my house. So back behind the garage. So materials delivered to the driveway. So I used actual mats because I got a friend of mine that gave them to me practically at cost, but I wanted it to be deeper. So first of all, lifted media up there. So there's your membrane. That's how the edge was done. Okay, so this here is your root barrier. It's just another layer of plastic. So it acts as the root barrier, but also helps protect that membrane. How did I keep that material there? All right, so here's my edge restraint. So you're thinking, how did I fasten that? Did I nail it in or screw it into the roof? Didn't want to do that because then you're putting holes in the membrane. So how'd you keep it there? Well, this is two-sided tape. So you just basically put it down. You say, well, that's not gonna hold it. And you're right, I'll get back to that in a minute. And I put down some water retention fabric, which also helps protect the membrane. It wasn't really necessary in this case because it's deep enough, but it's still helpful. So just spread out that geogrid. This is how I kept it in place. So I have a cable. So there's the, that's the edge restraint on one side. And then that cable goes through that, through the grid, and then over to the other side. So what it's doing, the weight of that meat is gonna be pushing down on that edge restraint, but it can't go anywhere because the cable is holding it in place. So fill that with media, then laid out the different mats. You can see what it looks like there on the side. This also gave me an instant green there in the middle of in the fall because I was afraid it might slide, which I didn't have that problem. I wanted other things besides just sedum. So I grew a bunch of allium plants and spread seed up there, started a whole bunch of different plugs, and then I just planted them. So started planting, and there you see what that roof looked like in August 2018. September of 19, and then what it looked like last summer. So I'm actually very happy with it. Okay, so with green roofs, what are your goals? First, the building stays up, okay? If you put a green roof on, the building collapses, that's not good for anybody, let alone someone might get hurt. So, I often get a question, I wanna put a green roof on. The first thing I'll ask is how much can your building or how much weight can it support? If it can't support any more weight other than snow load, then you can't do it unless you reinforce the building, which is generally never a cost-effective way to do it. If you're building something new, like I did on my garage there, then it could be designed for it. Okay, there shouldn't be any leaks. Often also get the question, well, if I put a green roof on, my roof's gonna leak. 
No, your green roof is actually gonna protect your membrane and make it last long. There could be damage to the membrane when the roof is put on if someone is careless, okay? That's not really the green roof itself, that's the people that did the project. It also can be a problem all right, say I, I have a green roof on the building and I have a leak, it is going to be more difficult to repair the leak. Because now you've got to at least move, find out where the leak is, then remove the green roof part to get down through the membrane in order to do the repairs. That's one advantage of say a modular system. And you also want to keep the plants alive. Your green roof is not going to function without the plants. You know, if, you, if you had the media up there, that's still gonna provide some insulation layer and some stormwater management, but it's also likely to erode or be blown away if you don't have the plants there to keep them in place. So it's a green roof, it should have plants on it. And that again goes back to how much media depth you have, where are you, you know, what's your climate and so forth, and what plants can actually do well there. I don't know how many times people have asked me they want to put out native, all native plants, nothing against natives, but what they're talking about here is herbaceous perennials on a very shallow roof. And I tell them it's not going to work unless they water it. And then I get a call back a year later saying everything's dead. And I say, well, how deep is it? Well, it's three inches. Well, I told you it had to be much more or they didn't water it. You've got to have the right plant for the right environment. What's the current status? As I mentioned in Germany, there's that Stuttgart, there's a lot of green roofs in that picture. So what's the difference between Germany and the US? Germany and a lot of Europe, there's, there's a lot, some lots of green roofs. US, everything pretty much looks like what you see there on the bottom. Although there are a lot more green roofs in the US than you think there is, you just don't see them. You've probably been past a lot of them and just didn't know they were there. That being said though, there's, I mean, if you took all the acreage of green roofs in the United States, it wouldn't even cover all your Walmarts. So there's a lot of opportunity for growth. So why are green roofs so common in Germany and not in the US? Lots of reasons. One, they started doing this right after World War II and it's just very common. One of the main reasons though is their whole um, tax structure or fee systems like for stormwater. In the US, everyone pays taxes for stormwater. That money goes into your municipal stormwater system or wherever it goes. So you don't get any individual benefit. In Germany, it's based on the impervious surface on your property. So if you have a large like Walmart type building with a huge parking lot of asphalt, you are going to pay a lot in stormwater fees. So by putting green roofs on the building, they cut their stormwater fees. There's actually, um, the bus station in the city of Oldenburg in Germany, they have a green roof on the top. They collect water that runs off. They use that to wash the buses. It goes back up. Essentially, they keep any stormwater from leaving their property and they do not pay any fees whatsoever for stormwater because they don't use it. In a lot of ways that makes sense to me. If I drive on the Ohio Turnpike, I pay for it. If I choose not to ride on, drive on it, I don't pay for it. Whereas in the US, that's really not an option, at least most places. I know some places like Raleigh, North Carolina, they actually have enacted a stormwater fee based on impervious surface for homeowners, but it, I think it maxes out at about $40. So it's not really very much, as opposed in Germany, you're actually going to pay a lot. Another factor is that because they put in so many more, they're a lot less expensive. You know, the economies of scale. It's not much more expensive to put on a green roof as it is to put on any other type of roof over there. In the US, it is. So what's the future hold? Maybe New York City will look like that someday. 
maybe not, but it would be where green roofs are really beneficial for something like urban heat island or energy or especially stormwater would be in cities. I mentioned all the problems of something like New York with stormwater. Green roofs could help alleviate that problem considerably. Now, where I live, I live kind of out in the country. I'm not connected to any stormwater system. So my green roof is primarily just because I wanted to do it. It's doing nothing for stormwater because the stormwater that runs off my property runs into my pond. So it's never going in, there's never a combined sewage overflow type of you know, deal. So like say in the middle of Oklahoma, out in the wheat field, you build a building with a green roof on it, as far as environmentally, it's not really doing much of anything. But in the middle of a city, it is, or it can. So that's really what the future holds. Hopefully someday we'll get there. Um, I guess we'll just find out. A couple of websites. Um, Green Roofs for Healthy Cities is a nonprofit organization based out of Toronto, Canada, which um, promoting Green Roofs. Greenroofs.com is kind of a, I mean, there's just lots of information on there about Green Roofs. So with that, um, uh, we'll take any questions. Uh, Brad, we had one here. The individual asks, is it possible to build green roofs on the concrete roof of a house in a tropical area? And is it possible then uh, when we need to be need to consider the plants not burning out from the heat? Okay, so is it possible to grow, have a concrete deck? Yes, actually that's one roof I referred to in the communication arts building that has a concrete deck, which is why mm -hmm. you could put almost anything up there. So what's underneath it, whether it's uh, plywood, like say in my doghouse or a concrete deck or any other system, you're going to be putting on your roof and then maybe you put on shingles or something else, or if you want to put a green roof on, then you're putting on those different layers. So that is very feasible to do. Okay. Now in the tropics, you're not going to grow sedum. Um, it's just going to die out. It, it likes, well, there is something called sedum mexicanum, but for the most part, the plants that I use are not going to survive. Like even, even putting them in like Florida, it's not so much that it's so hot or it dries out, it's that it's hot at night. So it never really gets a chance to catch up. So it has to do with plant selection. Most of the work on green roots has been done in Northern climates, like say Germany or the Northern United States, Canada. But there are a lot of people doing stuff in the tropics now. I see. It, okay. It really comes down to the right plant selection. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn mentions so some do some of the roofs get mowed given that they look so manicured in your in your shots. Okay. Some roofs are mowed, like that one in um, Singapore. That was just turf that's grown. You go to Cleveland, the Cleveland Convention Center has a roof, which is mown grass because people just go up and lay on it like it's a park. Most of them aren't. Um, the plant soil science building might have looked like it, but that was all sedum. It's just very shallow because that building is really weak that it's only about an inch and a half deep. So the plants never really reached their full potential. But yes, a roof could be mowed if if that was the design or that's what people wanted. Okay. And thank you. And I, I apologize. I had to jump out for a moment. It's possible you touched on this, but I was intrigued by, for example, the Dearborn, Michigan plant and some of the other industrial uh, areas. Were there tax breaks, tax incentives, I assume? Um, I know that's a big question, but could you say something like succinctly to answer that or what are your experiences? 
I think in a lot of cases there is. In, in Ford's case, there wasn't. Mm -hmm. What they did was, um, I don't know if you ever heard of William McDonough, but he's a big, he, he owns a couple of companies, but his primarily, his philosophy is not, everything should be reused. I mean, even tennis shoes, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, he, he influenced William Ford quite a bit and they were just going to spend the money to do it. So okay. in the long run, I mean, they spent several million dollars just putting on that green roof over and above what they would have done. But I think they actually got a return on that by quite a bit because originally they were just putting in that plant. When they put in the green roof, everyone wanted to see it. So they actually built... Um, it's in connection with the Henry Ford, which is a museum. So they take people over there and they have, they actually build a visitor center where you go in and you have all these old classic cars in there and they show you movies about the history of Ford and the whole process. And you can actually go through the plant, which is pretty amazing. There's a bunch of robots welding. There's not that many people that work in there anymore, but they have, hundreds of people every day just taking a tour and part of that is seeing the green roof and then just the pr part when they did that whole thing i don't know if people remember but it was back when firestone had all the problems with the tires and they were very connected with ford and it was a pr thing so it's actually worked out pretty well for them and then okay. the main reason for doing the whole stormwater system like the green roof was they were looking ahead thinking that they're going to have to build their own water treatment plant before any, any water gets discharged into the Rouge River. By putting the green roof on in combination with the porous pavement and so forth, they can keep water from ever entering it so they would not have to actually deal with any fines or something they would get from polluting that water. And actually, they claim that the water is cleaner running off the roof than it is falling on the roof. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but the media would tend to filter it. Mm -hmm. But it seems like a pretty, you know, whether that's true, I don't know. Okay. Excellent. I'm looking to see if I've, if I've missed, thank you, if I've missed any questions. I don't see, oh uh, yeah, there is another one. Would you say Europe is over 50% of green roofs or less? Um, throughout the, the entire continent, it's less than 50%. Okay. Some cities have over 50%. I think Let's Stuttgart, see. I think that's a pretty big city. I think right now it's about 40%, which is mm -hmm. an awful lot considering that a lot of those buildings you really can't put a green roof on them because they're not strong enough or they're, you know, there's too much slope. It's, you could do it, but it's not the ideal place to do it. This, your money is spent better elsewhere, in my okay. opinion, mm -hmm. anyway. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Brad, what growing meat did you put, uh, on the doghouse. Okay, so that was uh, the heat expanded shale, heat expanded slate. I just, I just, I had tons of it, so I used it. And it, it does work very well. So it was about 80% of that shale and about 20% compost to start with. Okay. Excellent. I mean, it can, you can grow green roofs almost anything, as long as you, I mean, if you, as long as you, re, you duplicate the chemical, remember the physical properties, like that shale looks like a lot of, uh, well, it basically looks like cinders. So if you haven't looked at, I haven't, but other people have looked at, like you get the bottom ash out of uh, like foundries, essentially cinders. So that would actually work. The problem with that is that it's often laced with a bunch of heavy metals. So it would have to be leached, you know, 
pretty thoroughly before you would ever put it on a roof. You're gonna end up with a bunch of lead and mercury growing, you know, flowing into your river. Okay. Yeah. Just putting up, um, like if I would have done that roof, just dug soil, I'm on pretty clay soil. If I would have just thrown that up there, it would have been a complete failure. Because it wouldn't have drained, it would have dried out and become bricks. But having something like that in the right plant selection, in that case, it's all sedum and a lot of alliums they put up there. I have planted some other things, but they tend to disappear just because it's too shallow. It's about three, three and a half inches, and I'm not going to water it. Plus, it slopes, so it's going to drain faster. Hmm. Okay. But I, I know some people that put it on some chicken coops. And if it's much deeper, you can grow grasses and so forth. And then the with the doghouse, it's something that's pretty visible. So I want it to look good. Yeah. I don't want it to have all these bare spots and dead stuff on it. So I I um although surprisingly, it doesn't take much work. Hmm. And it's it's definitely a conversation piece anytime someone sees it. Uh, I can only imagine on that. That's that's very cool. Very, very privileged dogs. In so, fact, that sorry. picture, I know someone, I've posted that before and people, other people have used it and I haven't looked for a long time, but there was actually someone who took the design and they're selling dog houses on the web that look exactly like it. Uh, I'm sure that's where they saw it. Okay. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brad, what project concept, uh, you know, there's only so many hours and dollars in the day, so to speak. What, what's in the back of your mind that you'd like to still tackle uh, career wise and green roofs that you haven't had a chance to approach yet? Um, I think the main thing that's going to, it's not really my area, but the thing that's going to get green roofs more common I mean, I think we know pretty much what plants to grow. There's what to grow them in. Maybe there's still some more research needs to be done on tropical areas. It's most of it's been in more northern climates, but what's gonna make a difference is gonna be public policy. Yeah. You know, if, if a company puts on a green roof and there's no advantage, okay, so they, uh, reduce the amount of stormwater that runs off that the city has to deal with, but the city doesn't want to give them any benefit for it, then are they going to do it? Mm -hmm. No. Most cases, no. I mean, look at U.S., look at Germany. Um, energy, I mentioned that one, but again, if that's the only thing you're looking at, it's, it's cheaper to put on more insulation. If it's okay. a... Uh, a public park on the roof, like in Vancouver, there's no space at ground level. So it makes sense to do it on a roof. If you're in a more suburban area, you know, do you need a park on a roof? Not really. Mm -hmm. but I think public policy is probably what is going to have the most impact. Okay. Excellent. Any, thank you. Anyone else? I'm trying to monitor both uh, chat Q&A boxes. We'll sure make sure these go to Dr. Rowe. I don't know about any, everybody else, but Brad, I'm going to have to go back and YouTube this three or four times. You just gave us so much great information for me to fully absorb it. I'm really excited though what I've heard. And like I said, looking forward to going back and replaying some of your thoughts and such. And it's been a great day. And I've been looking forward to this since out of last October, actually. But um, if there's not any other questions, we're going to wrap this up. And I will say I did a snafu on the recording, not on yours, Dr. Rowe, but on the uh, the preface to, to your uh, presentation. So I'm going to re-record here in a minute the introduction, because I definitely want to brag on your very impressive bio, and we'll cut and splice, and they'll make me look semi-intelligent on the YouTube, but uh, for today's purposes, I think we're done. Again, I'm looking one more time at the chat 
the Q and A, and I think people are being shy, but they're probably like me. There's just so much good information. I know we'll all go back when the YouTube is ready, hopefully in two or three weeks, and and uh, replace some of your thoughts and some of the things that you've challenged us to do. So, again, I'm grateful for your time today. Look forward to following your career up there in Lansing, and uh, thanks for for uh, giving us your time your precious time today to educate us and someday on my bucket list i want to physically get you down here but the next best thing was to zoom you down today so brad thanks again and and we'll wrap this up and um people i would just remind people uh, to look forward to june 17th dr dave creech from stephen f austin university is going to come and speak on woody plant propagation he's going to talk about red bud and surface and perhaps some other Woody generous. So uh, lots to look forward to in the next four weeks and then beyond. So on that note, we'll wrap this up. Uh, again, I'm going to re-record, but unless you came in late, uh, you're welcome to jump off. Otherwise, you're welcome to stay with me for a few uh, more moments or minutes, and, and then we'll literally shut down today. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Have a great day, and we'll talk again soon, okay? Right. If I could add one thing, I would say if you're looking at doing a green roof, if you're doing it on your house or any uh, you know building, I would definitely hire professionals to do it. But if you were doing something like a dog house or a little potting shed or something, you could all do it. Not that yeah. hard. When you uh, you just triggered a thought, actually. So when you when you went ahead and did this on your personal residence, was there any uh, conversation with, and you may have said that, I may have blown you off, sorry, with your insurance company, just anything of that nature, was that? No, <laughs> they didn't really know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the actual addition where I got the, the porch, I hired a contractor to do it, so he got the permits. Yeah. And he said it would have a green roof on it and no one ever said anything. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. I was out of ignorance on my end, but okay. And the insurance companies never mentioned it. I don't even know if they know I have it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to handle that. Sometimes hey, you just do it first. <laughs> absolutely. Beg forgiveness later. I get that. Yep. Yep. It works for me all these years. Thank you again so much. And right. we're going to go ahead and, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Professor Lewis says, if anything, they should lower your premium, your insurance <laughs> premium. Yeah, actually, um, it would make the house last longer. <laughs> and another thing as far as fire, one thing I didn't mention is the reason that Germany a lot of it started that way is they would, of course, every, when everything was built from wood and then a fire, you get all those uh, burning embers that would just blow and then get on the next house and then set that one on fire. The reason they put gravel up there to start with was to try to stop fire and then okay. the plants started growing in them. I see. So it is actually a fire retardant, so to speak. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Absolutely does. Good points. And, and thank you, Ching, for that comment as well. Folks, on that note, we're going to go ahead and conclude. Thanks again, Brad. In a moment, I'm going to re-record your uh, award-winning biography. And then we're going to uh, anxiously away to YouTube so we can all, again, further digest and, and get our minds around all the great concepts and things you've share with us today. So thanks for your time. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a great thank day, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.